Dr. Jost is going to be talking to us today about floaters, fatigue, and forgotten insulin. <coughs> Dr. Jost has been the intern uh, prepping all my cataract surgeries for the last three months. Um, he's done a fantastic job. A lot of you probably don't know him yet since he's sort of been hanging out at the VA, but I think you're really going to enjoy him as a resident um, because he's been very conscientious and a hard worker. So without further ado, let's get this over. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. So like Lloyd said, um, title of my presentation is Fl Floaters, Fatigue, and Forgotten Insulin. And these are the three um, presenting uh, complaints that a patient had uh, that I just saw recently at the VA about two weeks back. So a patient named CS, uh, chief complaint of dark squiggly floaters in the right eye. He's a 62-year-old male with had a three-day history of these dark floaters that he describes in a squiggly line pattern. Um, also accompanied with eye pain, blurred vision in the right eye. Um, patient states that he woke up um, with a painful eye, also some tearing and crusting of the lids, and some uh, mild photophobia. No trauma to the eye. Um, interestingly, the patient had been off of his insulin for two weeks prior to the onset of this. Um, he does have a history of poorly controlled diabetes. Uh, this is not uncommon for him. He uh, apparently went on vacation and just decided not to take his insulin with him. Um, also, he noted that his eye pain was increasing in severity. Uh, patient's past ocular history, uh, he denies any uh, past eye problems, no surgeries in the past or trauma. Um, like I stated previously, poorly controlled diabetic. Uh, I believe his most recent A1C in the VA system was over nine. Um, he's had two previous hospitalizations uh, for diabetic ketoacidosis, um, and he he admittedly told us that his blood sugars are usually in the two to 400 range. Um, also significant in his history, in 2005 at the Salt Lake VA, he had an admission um, in the ICU where he was severely septic. Uh, the source was right shoulder osteomyelitis, which grew out methicillin sensitive staph aureus. Um, during that same hospitalization, he had an infection of his parotid gland, which also grew out MSSA. Um, and somewhat unclear history of these pulmonary nodules that were sampled during that hospital stay, um, but resolved after antibiotic therapy. Um, for this right shoulder osteomyelitis, he was on IV antibiotics for three months uh, as an outpatient. Um, also significant for fungal infection of the groin, uh, recent dental abscess in which he did not complete his amoxicillin prescribed to him, um, and some other medical history of hypertension, high cholesterol, and reflux disease. Uh, no family history of eye disease. Uh, patient lives in Rock Springs, Wyoming. He's re retired. Um, no IV drug use history. He's never been incarcerated, never homeless. Um, his medications include uh, medications for uh, reflux disease, oral and uh, insulin for diabetes, uh, received statin and spironolactone for high blood pressure. He has no medical allergies uh, on review system. Uh, he complained of recent fatigue. However, he was ambulatory, still active, able to drive from Rock Springs, Wyoming to the Salt Lake VA, and also complaining of recent tooth pain. Um, more specifically, he denied any of the following feverish chills, night sweats, uh, chest pain, uh, skin rash, myalgias, arthralgias. Uh, on eye exam, um, his visual acuity with, with correction of the right eye was count fingers, uh, and his left eye was actually pretty good at 20-30. Uh, slight improvement on pinhole of the right eye. He had no afferent pupillary defect. Uh, his motility was full. Interocular pressures were 9 and 12, respectively, and his confrontational visual fields were full. Uh, on slit lamp exam, he did have some mild ptosis of the right eye and some periorbital uh, erythema. Uh, his conjunctiva and sclera, he had 2 plus injection of the right eye. Uh, he had some corneal edema, and these are actually bizarre linear keratic precipitates um, that none of us had actually seen before when we took a look at him at the slit lamp, but I have a picture of that coming up. Uh, also noted some guttata on the left eye. He did have three plus cell of the uh, anterior chamber of the right eye, and his, or excuse me, that should see left eye is quiet. Um, he also had some pigment on the anterior lens capsule of the right eye. So hopefully this projects well, but there's some linear precipitates here on the cornea and initially, we believed that these were actually on the anterior and posterior surface of the cornea. Um, 
it's not the best picture. This is an iPhone slip lamp photo. Um, <laughs> here's a more zoomed in picture. Thanks to Tom Oberg for taking these. He's really great at that. Um, you can see these linear, they're kind of brownish uh, golden in appearance. Uh, on fundus exam, he had three plus vitreous haze, three plus vitreous cell of the right eye. Um, and from what we could see, there was an elevated white lesion with overlying hemorrhages inferior to the optic nerve. Uh, the lesion appeared to be subretinal and elevated, and there were scattered mid-peripheral dot blot hemorrhages, um, probably secondary to his poorly controlled diabetes. So here's a photo. From what you can tell, the uh, fundus uh, landmarks are obscured. It doesn't project very well on the screen, but you know, the optic nerve under here and a white elevated lesion. Uh, actually, on indirect ophthalmoscopy, you could see a lot better than this photo shows. So from now, this patient was seen at the VA. We wanted to send them here to the Moran. We had to come up with a differential. So broad differential of panuveitis. He had inflammation of what appeared to be all chambers of the eye. Um, just to break it down, we have infectious causes and non-infectious causes, um, typical bacterial players, fungal, parasitic uh, organisms like toxoplasmosis. Um, other viral etiologies that can cause necrotizing viral retinitis, uh, tuberculosis, syphilis, and um, the patient with an unknown immune status, you always have to think of um, sequelae of HIV infection. Um, although CMV doesn't typically present as an elevated lesion, uh, the view wasn't good enough where we could say this was clearly not CMV. Uh, other possibilities include non-infectious sarcoidosis, masquerade syndromes, <coughs> Uh, vasculitides. So our assessment um, was panuveitis with the elevated peripapular retinal lesion, uh, surrounding retinal hemorrhages, and possibly subretinal abscess of the right eye. So our workup and initial management consisted of, um, he was sent here to the Moran urgently that afternoon. Uh, Dr. Shakur performed a vitreous tap where he actually took out one and a half cc's of vitreous. Um, it was sent for gram stain culture, fungal cultures. Uh, these following were sent for PCR, and these were done here. And then also bacterium fungal PCR was sent to the University of Washington, which took a while to come back. Um, vitreous was injected with gancyclovir, vancomycin, cetazine, and clindamycin. Um, did not know what was causing this, so we wanted to cover all our bases. Um, and then initial systemic workup, uh, he came back to the VA for labs. He had a PPD placed, uh, HIV and hepatitis uh, panel was drawn, test for syphilis, test for sarcoidosis, basic lab work, chest x-ray to look for any pulmonary nodules, um, and also blood cultures were sent, uh, also fungal blood cultures. Uh, patient was initially started on Bactrim, uh, acyclovir, and then cyclogel and prednisolone uh, topically. So on the second day, the patient came back to clinic here. His visual acuity had dropped um, a little bit to count fingers at two feet. Although he was subjectively feeling better, um, so that's a good sign for him. Uh, these, interestingly, these linear keratic precipitates had disappeared overnight, um, which confused us even more since we didn't know exactly what was causing them. Um, and then uh, additionally, intravitreal injection with voriconazole was added to cover for fungal. Um, gave him a couple more medications of fluconazole and azithromycin, cover for fungal and uh, also cover for toxoplasmosis. So here's a picture I just wanted to show that these keratic precipitates had disappeared. Uh, here's a uh, fibrin plaque on the anterior lens capsule that appears to be resolving. Uh, maybe a small hypocaon down here, it's difficult to see. A zoomed in picture just showing that fibrin plaque and also some corneal edema. And it's a nice sli slip beam photo where it shows what those keratic precipitates were that are no longer evident. So a better picture of the fundus, um, <coughs> a little bit better visualized on this day. You can see this fluffy raised lesion with some surrounding hemorrhages. Another photo basically showing the same thing. Um, 
So follow-up days five through eight. Um, we had a lot of our lab work back, which was nice to have. We did show just a mild leukocytosis uh, with a left shift. Uh, interestingly, one blood culture came back positive for Staph aureus. Um, we thought maybe this was a contaminant, um, so we resent uh, blood cultures. Uh, not really high uh, ESR, CRP, not super high either. And actually all of his other systemic lab work came back negative, PPD, syphilis workup, et cetera. Um, the initial sensitivity of that positive blood culture revealed that it was methicillin sensitive Staph aureus, um, and then the repeat blood cultures were still pending. Um, so two days later, once the repeat blood cultures came back, showed MSSA again. Um, once we found this out, he was still ambulatory, still feeling generally well. Um, we saw him in clinic on the Monday and he was sent to the VA for evaluation uh, of this bacteremia in the emergency department. So medicine department evaluated him, decided to be admitted with this bacteremia. He started on nafcillin, two grams uh, every four hours to treat the bacteremia. Um, we discontinued acyclovir and Bactrim. We uh, discussed this with the primary team and we felt that this was the best option. Uh, we did not think this was a viral etiology and the Bactrim was not gonna do the same job as, as the nafcillin. Um, infectious disease was consulted to help identify the source. Um, and because we weren't exactly sure that this lesion in the eye was caused by staph, we wanted to make sure to keep on our fungal coverage until uh, our final PCRs from the University of Washington came back negative. Uh, actually, his, via, or his visual acuity on day of admission would improve significantly to 2060, uh, and you'll see throughout the presentation how that changes. Uh, he had a transthoracic echocardiogram, which is the initial test to look for endocarditis. Um, this was negative for any vegetations, but of course they had to do the obligatory transesophageal echocardiogram just with a higher positive predicted value. Um, did show a two millimeter highly mobile thick mobile thickening of the aortic valve consistent with aortic valve endocarditis. I wish I had a picture of the echocardiogram vegetation. Two millimeters is pretty small and I'm not sure how that would have projected up here. Um, on follow-up day, day number 12, uh, his visual acuity, like I stated, was 2060. His exam was stable. Um, azithromycin fluconazole was discontinued. Uh, however, we did continue the topical therapy with a steroid to reduce inflammation and cyclogel to uh, prevent any formation of posterior synechiae. Uh, a CT of his orbits and brain was uh, obtained, although we would have preferred an MRI to better characterize the possible abscess in the brain or uh, posterior to the orbits. Um, there was no uh, abscess seen on the CT. Uh, patient did start to develop worsening renal function while in the hospital as creatinine, I believe, was initially 1.1, 1.2 range and bumped up to a high ones, almost low twos range. Um, a little bit conflicting uh, thoughts on what was causing this, but one of the, one of the possibilities was that he was flicking off uh, septic emboli to his uh, kidneys. Um, patient was, uh, had repeat blood cultures, which were negative. Once they were negative for 48 hours, he was discharged home on IV antibiotics for six weeks at minimum. So here's some better photos. Uh, at follow-up appointment, you can see this almost boat-shaped hemorrhage, um, this fluffy vitreous uh, opacity that's protruding forward, uh, and some elevation of the lesion as well. Nice montage photo of the same thing. Also some peripheral dot blot hemorrhages. Here's an OCT through the lesion. Uh, you can see here that the retina is swollen, or edematous. Uh, Choroid appears normal and intact, and then this is a sub-retinal lesion. So the rest of my discussion today will focus on endogenous endophthalmitis. Here's a nice uh, graph of the branching point between what we see more commonly is exogenous post-operative endophthalmitis, um, but I'm gonna focus on the endogenous causes which uh, account for less than 10% of uh, endophthalmitis. Our patient would probably be classified as a diffuse case and posterior, if you're gonna break it down. So endogenous endophthalmitis, due to a hematogenous spread of organisms, like I mentioned, less than 10% of all forms of endophthalmitis are due to endogenous causes. 
Um, all ages can be afflicted, um, typically much sicker patients in general, and that's why our case was quite unusual because he was ambulatory and, and <coughs> carrying on with his daily life just fine. Uh, right eye is twice uh, as common to be affected as the left eye. The thought is there that it's uh, the right carotid artery comes off the aortic trunk, more proximal location. Um, it can be bilateral in up to 25% of cases. Um, extraocular focus can be found in, in up to 90% of cases, which I thought was a pretty high, uh, high number. Um, and these top four here, endocarditis, meningitis, skin and wound infections, and pneumonia are more common in the west. Uh, down here, hepatobiliary infections, more common in the east. Uh, liver abscesses is commonly seen in, the, in, the, in Asia. Um, some case reports of intra-abdominal infections like ileocoas abscesses, so CT imaging is, is warranted in if your history dictates that. Risk factors for endogenous endophthalmitis, clearly immunocompromised patients, not necessarily in severely ill HIV patients and uh, neutropenic and organ transplantation patients, but actually in a run-of-the-mill diabetic patients. Um, this number is actually pretty similar to the amount of diabetic patients I have at the VA. And, uh, <laughs> and this, this is a pretty strikingly high number of the, uh, the case series that, I've, that I researched, uh, up to 50% of cases of patients that had concomitant diabetes. Um, other things that we see a lot of, chronic renal failure, malignancies, um, don't see so much HIV, but the obvious, obvious risk factor for this, uh, especially fungal causes. Um, IV drug abuse, again, another um, player that involves fungal endophthalmitis. People with valvular heart disease, recent surgeries, uh, people with chronic indwelling lines and catheters, as our patient did have for about three months. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, that was listed on uh, one of the reviews that I did see, but I, I didn't see a long discussion about the pathogenesis and, and how that is, uh, how you could, could view it as a uh, immunocompromised state, I would say. Um, also, burn patients uh, more susceptible to infections and patients with chronic antibiotic use. Uh, just to highlight a couple things that our patient did have, diabe diabetes, poorly controlled, um, chronic indwelling lines and catheters, although this was many, many years ago, and also uh, long-term use of antibiotics. So why diabetes? Just a quick review on why diabetic patients tend to get more infections. Um, there's an increased incidence of bacteremia in general in diabetics, although the overall mortality is not higher. The attributable mortality to bacteremia is higher in the diabetic patients. Um, on the biochemical level, some of the things that uh, cause uh, poor immune function, neutrophil chemotaxis is depressed along with phagocytosis, bactericidal activity, um, cell-mediated immunity are all depressed in diabetes patients, um, specifically those with hyperglycemia as our patient had. Uh, specifically, one thing, methylglycation, this is a major uh, cause of uh, glycemic uh, damage in diabetic patients. Uh, specifically inhibits IL-10, interferon gamma, and TNF-alpha from T cells. Uh, we all know that diabetics get vascular, have vascular insufficiency. This leads to uh, some ischemia of local tissues and destruction and depressed bactericidal function of leukocytes. Neuropathy <coughs> of uh, typically in the lower extremities leads to microtrauma and a, uh, an opening for bacteria to enter the bloodstream. Um, and then lastly, I think is actually most important in our ca patient case is that skin and mucosal colonization with pathogens like staph, like candida, uh, is seen at a higher incidence in, in diabetic patients asymptomatically. Uh, this would predispose them to transient bacteremia, um, which is uh, possibly how our patient come came to uh, develop a aortic vegetation. So clinical features of it, endogenous endophthalmitis. Uh, Typical things you see with any infection, fever, chills, elevated white blood cell count, left <coughs> shift, uh, positive blood cultures. Commonly ill patients, hospital bound those in the ICU, although we can see ambulatory patients as seen uh, with our patient here. <coughs>
uh, acute in onset, blurred vision, sensitivity to light, um, can see fibrin in, you can see fibrin in the anterior chamber with or without hypopion, um, vitreous inflammation, which can be marked, um, retinal subretinal abscesses, Roth spots, and also can present as a, a, a feared presentation of panoplomitis with all layers of the eye uh, involved. So the pathogenesis, uh, briefly, uh, micro microorganisms enter retinal circulation and lodge in small capillaries. Uh, the areas of the highest blood flow in the eye, uh, particularly the retina, choroid, ciliary body, are preferentially affected. Uh, in order to invade the tissues, the pathogen must cross, must cross the blood ocular barrier. Uh, this is thought to be through direct invasion of septic emboli, emboli and also changes in the vascular endothelium. Um, if the infection does spread into the vitreous, it is, uh, develops in the retina and then breaks through uh, into the vitreous cavity. Um, and then the poor visual outcome that typically follow are due to the high inflammatory um, uh, cells in the, in the vitreous cavity and throughout the eye and also through direct invasion of the organism. Microbiology, briefly. Uh, fungal is by far the most common cause, in, with candida species being uh, the most common fungal. Um, candida species typically have a better prognosis and are, are e more easily treated than things like aspergillus, which tend to have a poor prognosis. Um, in terms of bacterial causes, gram positives are the uh, most common, with uh, strep being the uh, most common player here. Uh, and and actually, Staph aureus is more involved in cutaneous infections than you'd think of the uh, endocarditis or uh, intra-abdominal uh, GI infections. Uh, Gram-negative uh, bugs are also uh, another feared pathogen, and these typically, in general, have a, a poor prognosis as well. So I just wanted to highlight here that Staph aureus is what our patient had risk factors that are seen are diabetes, so he had started to develop some renal failure, did have some intravenous catheters in the past. Um, although we didn't see any cutaneous infections in him, does have a history of septic arthritis. So our patient does fit quite well with uh, some of these series that are, have seen similar patients. Just a brief comparison between fungal and bacterial uh, endogenous endophthalmitis. So the couple case series here that present uh, fungal versus bacterial. Fungal in, in particular is more indolent, slower growing. Bacterial presentation is more explosive like our patient had. Um, more seen bilateral with fungal. Uh, blood culture is very, very highly positive in bacterial uh, endogenous endophthalmitis. Uh, and here's a brief uh, comparison between prognosis. Uh, they called greater than 2400 a good prognosis. Uh, in terms of outcome, and you can see that there's quite a range of, of data in terms of who achieved better than 2,400. Um, important here is that there is a very, very significant incidence of either no light perception or just light perception vision. So in terms of diagnostic recommendations, um, I feel that we followed um, what's been seen in the literature, either an aqueous or vitreous tap. Um, Vitreous tap and vitrectomy have a higher yield of organisms, uh, with vitreous taps being cited as having up to 80% yield rate, um, although our tap did come back negative for all our tests sent. Um, this was consistent with uh, the appearance of the lesion being subretinal, hadn't broken through into the vitreous, so it actually wasn't uh, too surprising that our uh, cultures came back negative. Uh, PCR can be useful. Uh, either panbacterial or panfungal primers. Uh, those were the uh, tests that we sent up to the University of Washington to help <coughs> make our diagnosis. Uh, things like fluorescein angiography, B-scan, CTs, and MRIs of the orbits can be helpful if the diagnosis is still unclear. In our patient, we didn't uh, opt to do B-scan just because our, our view was actually good enough where we didn't feel it was necessary to, to need a B-scan. Um, the role of vitrectomy is still very unclear in uh, cases of endogenous endophthalmitis as, as opposed to uh, exogenous endophthalmitis. And important note is that the EDS study does not apply in terms of recommendations to this because it's endogenous. Um, 
So why, why do we choose to do a vitrectomy? You can provide additional material for culture, uh, remove debris from the eye, and possibly better distribution of antibiotics. I don't think there's any great data to support that um, outcomes are much better with vitrectomy. Um, in terms of systemic workup, of course, we always are told there's no substitute for a careful history, especially in patients with uveitis. Um, this can be aided by internist or infectious disease as we uh, utilize blood and urine cultures, um, HIV testing in patients with un unknown immune status, chest radiographs, echocardiogram, leading cause of endocarditis by far is staph aureus, and patients with uh, staph bacteremia, up to 30% of those actually have aortic or, uh, cardiac vegetation, so no doubt. Intravitreal therapy, cover for bacterial pathogens, vancomycin for gram positives, ceftazidine or amikacin and gentamicin to cover for gram negatives. These last two, amikacin and gentamicin, have fallen out of favor somewhat just due to the potential risk for retinal toxicity. And then also a careful balance between these and steroids. Um, uh, our patient of, of note was not injected with dexamethasone. Uh, in terms of covering for fungal pathogens, nephrotericin, loiconazole, we chose loiconazole um, as there is also some uh, potential risk with nephrotericin. Um, an important note is to avoid steroids when either fungal or viral uh, pathogens are suspect suspected, which is why I believe Dr. Shakur opted not to uh, inject with dexamethasone. Uh, early treatment obviously is very important. Um, one study that shows uh, better visual outcomes with treatment in, uh, that started 24 hours within diagnosis. In terms of topical therapy, um, this is, is less important, however, uh, in terms of preventing posterior senechiae, secondary glaucoma. Uh, topical antibiotics can be used if there's uh, uh, intense uh, infection of the anterior portion of the eye, keratitis. Um, cycloplegias, like I've said, to prevent senechiae formation, and if they start to develop secondary glaucoma, ocular hypotensives can be used. In terms of surgical therapy, no great recommendations for vitrectomy. Um, some things to consider when you would use a vitrectomy are diffuse posterior cases, uh, prominent vitreum, vitreous involvement, uh, patients that are not getting better despite this optimum uh, medical management, uh, especially virulent organisms like gram positives, or excuse me, gram negatives and uh, aspergillus would be a, a, a good reason to why to choose vitrectomy. Uh, patients with uh, poor visual acuity uh, on presentation might like, might benefit from a, a vitrectomy. And then also, I, I believe we got somewhat fortunate in this case with having a positive blood culture with uh, all the rest of our studies coming back negative. Um, this might have been a reason why we uh, chose to do a complete vitrectomy in this patient if, if we wouldn't have had the positive blood culture. Um, other secondary issues that can develop are retinal detachments, holes, and tears that need to be managed um, either initially or later down the road. In terms of systemic therapy, um, this is better left to our uh, internal medicine colleagues. However, um, cover for gram positives. Vancomycin is great for gram positives, also MRSA. Uh, aminoglycosides or third generation cephalosporins, which cover for uh, pseudomonas and gram negatives. Um, and then once sensitivities return, it's important to tailor your uh, intravenous antibiotics uh, appropriately based on cultural results. Um, like I mentioned, vancomycin, MRSA, IV drug users, uh, nafcillin, oxacillin are great choices for MSSA, which our patient was placed on. Um, if, fungal, uh, if a fungal pathogen is identified in culture, uh, amphotericin, although we know that there's uh, quite a bit of uh, toxicity systemically with amphotericin, uh, other choices, buconazole, voriconazole, caspofungin. Um, and then also important to continue to cover for other players that could, could potentially be affecting the patient. We weren't sure initially viral or parasitic or fungal. That's why we kept those other uh, oral uh, medications on board. Uh, in terms of complications down the road, both systemic and ocular, uh, 
Um, every system can be affected. Obviously, a patient with uh, sepsis that develops severe sepsis and shock, uh, potentially uh, life-threatening. Uh, in terms of the eye, uh, things like tractional retinal, retinal detachment, uh, hemorrhages in the back of the eye, cataracts, epigretinal membrane, secondary glaucoma, sympathetic ophthalmia, hypotony, which is a, a poor prognosticator, and also kysis. Um, in terms of prognosis, a lot of conflicting data again. Um, important to note that uh, up to 10% of patients with fungemia have ocular involvement, so very important to keep in mind if you're seeing a patient in the hospital that's admitted with fungemia. Typically, patients that are fungemic are severely, severely immunocompromised. That's why the mortality rate is so high. Um, also goes to show that our patient didn't necessarily fit in with a lot of the studies uh, that were published based on the severity of his uh, underlying immunosuppression. Uh, uh, visual prognosis is generally poor. Um, some of the poor prognosticators are those afflicted with more virulent organisms, uh, patients that are sicker in general, uh, delay in diagnosis, the wide range of initially misdiagnosed cases, um, and only about 50% of patients that present with endogenous endophthalmitis are initially seen by an, an ophthalmologist. Um, other poor prognosticators, like I mentioned, are obviously retinal detachment, low intraocular pressure, and uh, worse visual acuity on presentation. Uh, I mentioned aspergillus and gram negatives associated with worse prognosis, and staph actually uh, seem to be associated more with a better prognosis, which is fortunate in this patient. So, in terms of our patient, I actually saw him yesterday in clinic at the VA. His visual acuities dropped a little bit to 2150. Um, although his, uh, on fundoscopic exam, his hemorrhages seem to be dissipating somewhat. Um, he is on a home effusion pump and he was using it when I was there. He did have trouble with it uh, last week where it broke, uh, which I thought was perfect for him. But uh, he is being compliant with his medications, which is very, very important. Uh, we will be following him weekly and uh, important consideration for him, any type of uh, dental procedure, uh, intra-abdominal procedure, he's gonna need prophylactic antibiotics uh, just because of his history. And that's it, I wanna thank Dr. Shakur specifically for helping me with this presentation and uh, all the photographers that helped get all these images up. So, any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Start over here, Dr. Jensen. And the reverse of that is also true. I mean, these patients do come in uh, through general medicine, and, and they're really sick. They're often so sick they're not thinking about the fact that they've got a blurry eye or something's happening. They just got encephalopathy, and they don't get to be looked at. And I see how often they're days and days later, and they say, well, I can't see very well out of the right eye. And it's just very strange. talked about the fact that
that's a good point. I know there are some valvular abnormalities, um, like excrescences that come off the uh, aortic valves that could be seen as a possible vegetation. I think maybe there was a, a chance that they overcalled this because of his bacteremia and they were quite worried about it. Um, I don't have exact numbers of false positive rates. I do I know. I guess, I mean, I'm using that to raise a very important point. I read a, a very interesting book called Older Guys in Their 70s and 80s, you know, kind of the latest in regards to concern about this. And, and uh, it, it's now blown up in our, in our face in medicine, not in ophthalmology, but in urology, where we see a face like this. And uh, the, the, the latest information is, is that for every 40, a CT scan of the liver looking in general for something that the study showed you'll find an abnormality worthy of liver biopsy 20% of the time in the general population and that the mortality is really nothing the mortality is really the liver biopsy at least are we likely to kill a person doing the, uh, doing the you know just first performing a liver biopsy in, in general mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's going to become increasingly thought it was important that the infectious disease people didn't just stop at, at the echo once it was positive. We initially additionally got the CT scan of the brain, which would have been better visualized with MRI. Um, well, there's no question that there right. was a force here. Right. Uh, uh, I, I just, <coughs> you know, I, it's, it's important, and, and obviously antibiotics is going to improve this, but the, the, the area of uh, it, it, I had an interesting little reaction when you heard that. Have you ever had false positive rates? Mm -hmm. Dr. Warner? Well, I just um, agree with Dr. Warner that this is kind of interesting because uh, we've already had some of the same antibiotic efficacy results in the study. And I think that's really important because we never had a dose sequence like that. Uh, and just having the same thing happen to me that was so important to me to get some antibiotics. So I think there's two really interesting points that you made. But uh, did Dr. Keith get his MRI? He did, I forgot to mention that, he did have a dental evaluation uh, it, pretty early on in the course when we saw him, we sent him over to the dentistry department at the VA and the dentist took a, what's that? Yeah, the next day and the dentist wasn't really impressed with it, but he did end up having a root canal a few days later. So it's kind of a mixed picture in terms of what was really causing it. <laughs> he did have a sore tooth and I, I was, I was. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And we we think of we think of strep viridans as, as one of the what we're taught as terms of uh, organisms in the mouth, but staph and MSSA and actually MRSA are actually seen actually in higher incidence in the mouth than we once thought previously. True, true.